I'm really glad you could join us for a conversation where we take a really informal approach to diving deep into the important issues of our time while also kind of uncovering what makes important influential people tick. And there's nobody more important or influential than today's guest, Eric Lambin. Uh, we're, Eric is the, is the Ishiyama Provostial Professor in Sanford's School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences and a senior fellow in the uh, Woods Institute for the Environment. He's a geographer who's made a, a series of really major contributions. He, early in his career, Eric worked on the uh, what deforestation is and figured out how to measure it and how to, how to uh, interpret complicated satellite data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for the noise to stop. <laughs> He has, he's good at controlling voodoo. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but, but you know what, what I think has really been the most influential part of Eric's career is that once he figured out the what of deforestation, he really turned to trying to understand the why. And, and the why isn't about you know, what makes the chainsaw or the tractor run, it's what kind of uh, political and economic and cultural factors have led the people to make the changes in the ecosystems around the world. Uh, he's been a pioneer in understanding not only what drives deforestation, but what drives reforestation and, and why we live in a world that it, that it looks the way it does. Uh, part of the reason that we're here today is that Eric was recently honored with the Blue Planet Prize, which is in many ways the highest honor that an environmental scientist can receive. And it's a really deep recognition of Eric's lasting contributions to understanding the forces that are shaping our planet. As a little pitch for Stanford, I want to point out that Eric is the fourth uh, Stanford faculty member to receive the Blue Planet Prize. And he follows out on um, terrain that has been honorably tread by Paul Ehrlich Hal Mooney and Gretchen Daly before him. And uh, I, I can't wait to see who the next Stanford winner of the, of the Blue Planet Prize is. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you. The, the, the format for today's conversation is that I'm going to ask him questions for a, for a half hour or so, and then we'll have another 45 minutes for you to ask your questions, so you can start thinking of them now. And uh, I like to use these uh, conversations as a way to kind of get behind the issues. But Eric has been uh, in incredibly influential in, in building lots of dimensions of this relationship between um, well, what he calls pixel and people, the relationship between uh, individual decisions and, and the, their interface with nature. His book, or his most, the book that influenced me the most is called um, The Ecology of Happiness. And, and I'd, I'd like to start out with a question about the ecology of happiness and, and your thoughts on uh, sort of, you know, why we need nature. Right, so I. <laughs> Well, first, thank you for being here and for inviting me. And uh, um, I think that's really at the heart of, of human environment interactions, you know, how nature influences our well being. The discourse on sustainability for a long time, when I wrote the book in 2008 or something, was very much gloom and doom that was kind of turning off a number of people. And, and I was trying to find a more positive way to. Uh, you know, a narrative that would be more enthusiastic for a number of, of people. Um, and, and of course, that was a broad audience book. So my question was, you know, can we find some positive reasons why we should preserve nature and not just avoid some looming catastrophe? And, and, and I start to dive into the literature on uh, the psychology of the environment. And, and I just discovered you know, a whole wealth of very little known studies that and with very rigorous experimental design where they were really testing 
you know, what, what nature does for our well-being. And, and, and you know, it, it, the very first study was Ehrlich in 1984. He, he, he went into a hospital. He took a, a sample of patients who had some major surgery, and half of them had a room with a view on nature and the other half on a parking lot. And then he tracked them, and there was a very, very significant difference on how quickly they were recovering and, 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 and the amount of painkillers and, and, and so And that led to a whole suite, a whole industry of research that became, became much more rigorous with randomized controlled trial. Now, the, the, the intriguing question is, is why is nature so essential for well-being? And there we can only theorize. No, we can only speculate. It's very hard to make experiment about that. You know, it's just not very ethical. But, uh, but one of the, uh, at the, at the basis of a lot of the theories is this concept of biophilia, that we, we all descend for hunters and gatherers that have been selected for generations, for hundreds and thousands of generations, for the ability to read nature, you know, to identify animals, to to hide their families, to uh, recognize plants that are edible or not edible. And somehow there's been some lasting effect of that coevolution with nature that still influences you know, the well-being we derive from, from, from being so close with nature. And, and how do you think that uh, relates to you personally? What, what satisfaction do you get out of studying problems that are deeply natural in their origin? Well, I, I guess that's how I got in this sector in the first place. You know, I, my initial motivation was, was you know, this affinity with nature. I was very fortunate that my parents lived next to a big forest, and I've always spent a lot of time in, 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 in wandering in the forest. And I've always been in, in passionate about horses. And, and horses, of course, it's a great way to be connected with nature. You know, they are beautiful animals, but they are very natural, you know, in the sense they're very dynamic, very lively, very beautiful. And, and, and it has always been a big part of my, my own life and my own one big, so, uh, yes. And do you, what do you do now in order to uh, make sure that that connection with nature persists? Well, I still ride every day, so mm -hmm. that's still a big part of my life. I do all the maintenance and all the care of the horses myself when I'm in Belgium, at least, not not here, and I, you know, and, and, and hiking out is, is, is quite essential. What, what strikes me, I'm coordinating a seminar for first year PhD students, actually, they're all in the room here, and, and, and on the, on the, after two or three weeks, we always ask them to talk about their hobbies, and 99% and of them mention climbing, hiking, skiing, you know, as, as a key hobby of theirs, so it's clearly something that's rooted, I think, in many of system scientist, yes. And, and when you think about the future and keeping open this pathway to finding satisfaction from nature, uh, do, do you think we're on a sustainable path with the kinds of, uh, like the reforestation activities that you study? Well, I think we are really on two tracks. Globally, of course, we are really damaging the you know, earth system support capacity. But on the other hand, I think there's now increasing recognition. And, and we do develop a lot of what I call small solutions, local solutions, such as greening, campus like this one, greening cities, trying to reconnect people with nature in a very local basis. And I think the big challenge now is, is now that we know how to do this and recognize the benefit for, for human well-being, uh, it, it, it's hard to operate at a, at a much larger scale, you know, how to, how to upscale all these small solutions that we've been testing and, uh, and piloting in many places. Now, reforestation is one way. It's uh, becoming very popular over the last couple of years. You know, it's part of what we call nature climate solutions, some ways to mitigate climate change, not through technology, but by using nature as uh, trees to absorb some carbon from the, uh, from the atmosphere, soils also to sequester some massive amount of carbon. But uh, of course, when you do the math, and you even just back of the envelope calculation, if you evaluate the amount of reforestation that would require to have a significant impact on the climate, then suddenly you enter into massive trade-offs with food production or other ways we use land. So, so that, that's one of the key findings of land use science, is just to try to quantify you know, how we could fit all these land uses 
on, on the limited surface we have and, uh, and, and, and provide all these services. And one, one of the things I really admire about your work is the way that you have found ways to um, do many examples of a particular process and then fit them together into a systematic uh, understanding of what's going on. And the, the reforestation agenda has, has certainly been one. I, and one of the things that's surprising is how reforesting in one country doesn't necessarily result in more forests worldwide. Right. Help us understand that. Yes, yeah, so this is coming from, I mean, as you mentioned, I've been working for many years on the causes of deforestation, and I kind of became a bit depressed by working every day, you know, on these beautiful forests going away. So at one point, I said, well, let's shift gear, and I started to work on what we call the forest transition. A few countries have shifted over the last couple of decades from net deforestation to net reforestation. Vietnam is the first one we studied, you know, Costa Rica, Bhutan, other cases. And we started with Vietnam, and, and we started to document the change in forest cover. And it's just amazing. If you look at the curve, you see forest cover in Vietnam going down for 50 years. And then there's a turning point really sharp from one year to the other. They just go to massive reforestation with a rate of reforestation twice as high as the rate of deforestation before. And so we got really a bid, and we published that, and we started to go to talks, and, uh, and, and we advertised that, that research. Then one day I was reading the newspapers, and I just see you know, two lines, exports of timber for Vietnam or, uh, have exploded. I say, what? You know, how, how, can, how can they export timber when they protect completely the forest? So we start to investigate that. And what we found out, it was a massive amount of trade from Laos and Cambodia, the neighboring countries, into, into uh, uh, um, uh, Vietnam. And Vietnam was processing this wood and then uh, exporting it back to China, Europe, and elsewhere. So in effect, what they were doing, they were just offshoring their land use, their deforestation, to their neighbors. And, and we all know that uh, Cambodia and Laos were, you know, were very weak states, very poor governance. And, and, and about half of that import was illegal trade of timber. Very hard to quantify. You know, we, we spend a lot of time to try to, by doing a full budget of the you know, timber sector in Vietnam, to try to put a number. So we published that. And, and I, I remember very well, I had a very good colleague, Tom Riddell, who t once was giving a talk and said, OK, we have all these forest transition countries. With just one exception, you know, there's Vietnam. Vietnam is mostly off offshoring its deforestation elsewhere. So he was assuming that was an outlier. And I said, well, maybe not. So we started to systematically study each of these forest transition countries. And we found that all of them, with no exception, as they were protecting their forests, they were also increasing their import of either food or timber in different ways, of course. But, uh, so that was, and, and overall, that was more or less equivalent to 50% of the reforestation. So it's really a, a kind of half gla a glass half full and half empty, half empty because what they protect in the territory is just being offshored abroad, and half full because actually half of their forests are not being offshored, and, and it just results in, in more efficiency in their land use. And, and is it the case that where this offshoring is occurring, it's usually weaker states with weaker institutions and uh, poorer people who are bearing the brunt of the deforestation? Well, that's where it gets interesting, actually, because not always. Initially, my assumption was that offshore, this offshoring was a bad thing. You know, you just push your, your deforestation elsewhere, and that's only the case with Cambodia and Laos. But then as we kept studying that, for instance, we studied Bhutan, even Bhutan, you know, this small Himalayan kingdom, very, very closed economy, very little trade, they have protected their forests, and even there, they were uh, offshoring their land use elsewhere. But they were importing most of their timber from India, and that timber was coming from forest plantation, tree plantation that are very, very well managed. While in Bhutan, you have these very rich, biodiverse forests, primary forests. So I would rather see this timber coming from plantations that are well managed in India rather than from the uh, forest uh, uh, in, in Bhutan. So in that case, from an ecological viewpoint, it's a good thing. And that's, of course, what economists tell us about trade. You know, tr the whole point of trade is that you're more efficient. And so you, you, of course, get your goods from places that are more efficient. 
but, but often these calculations miss the social and, and ecological impact of some of these offshoring. And, and when we think about the forest transition in the countries that are increasing in forest, how much of it really is creation or protection of biodiverse natural systems versus just increasing plantation forestry and, and really doing it in a commercial way? Again, it, it depends, you know, and that's the frustrating things about geography. We always try to generalize, but we work through case studies, and, and once we have many case studies, we try to draw lessons and, and find some common patterns. And, and that's another point where it really depends. Uh, in Vietnam, it was about, the forest transition was about 50% tree plantations around cities to supply the uh, cities with timber, and 50% natural regeneration just land being abandoned uh, 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 and left to regenerate. But if you go to Chile, it's even worse. You know, it's mostly tree plantations. And, you're, and, and worse, you know, they clear primary forests in order to plant eucalyptus and pine for export. So, so, so that's the other extreme. And you have everything in between. I, uh, I can't help asking about the relationship between those processes and the Trillion Tree Initiative, uh, which as a, as a geographer and an, an environmental scientist, what do you think of the Trillion Tree Initiative? Well, I think it's great to have these ambitious targets. You know, it just helps to focus attention, focus efforts. Of course, if you do plant one trillion trees, the question is which species, in which locations, are they going to compete? Do they live? <laughs> yes, do they survive? And a small fraction of, of these trees actually survive more than one year. Uh, do they compete against other land users? What would be their impact on, uh, on biodiversity? Are they mostly exotic species or indigenous species? So, so the devil is in the detail, as, as, as always. And, and again, when, when these kind of approach are in the realm of small solutions, local solutions to improve a community, a watershed, then you will find. But when you try to upscale them, that's why you need to think very deeply about what do they mean you know, at, at, at the global scale when you, you, you have and, these massive reforestation. And, and when we think about a trillion trees or even a, a billion trees, the, the availability of the land resource becomes a key issue. And you've written a lot about the looming crisis in terms of total land availability. Help us understand what's going on Yes, there. what's quite striking about land use, it's, it's, you know, it's a very vast field, and, and a lot of literature is quite specialized. Someone would work on forest, another one on tree plantations, someone else on protected areas, on cropland, on biofuels, on degraded land. And, and, but there are very few attempts to bring all these dimensions together, but in the end, they all have to fit on the amount of land we have on, on our planet. And so at one point, we did that exercise through a workshop. You know, we just brought all the specialists around the table and, and, and to try to estimate you know, what are the you know, most likely figures of, of how much land is under these different land use and what would be projections. And, and that paper was projected for 2020. You know, here we are. And, and as we did that, suddenly we realized, actually, you know, we don't have that much surplus land. You know, we don't have so much spare land that we can just assume you know, can be used for more biofuel, et cetera. And of course, if you just look at biofuels, yes, there will be plenty of land, but if, if you have to put biofuels plus more protected areas, plus more tree plantation, plus more cropland because the population is expanding, that's only you realize that they're all targeting the same land. And these are all this productive land. And, and, and there's very, very little consultation, very little mapping where all these projections are being put on top of each other. And that's where you realize that uh, you know, there's, there will be a crunch time at some point and we'll, we'll have to be much more efficient in the way we use that land. And we need to be more efficient in the way we think about the land for human uses and the amount of land that nature is gonna need if we're gonna have sustainable natural systems. Right, yes. And, and that's where you realize that this concept of nature climate solution can at best help at the margin, you know, the bulk, and that's really 95 to 98% of the solution will have to come from less emission from 
urbanization, industry, transportation, and of course, tree plantation, better land management, better soil management to sink some carbon can help to save some time and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and just smooth all that transition. But, but frankly, there's no prospect that most of the problem will be resolved through tree plantation or other means. Do you think the environmental community is getting it wrong on natural climate solutions? I think we are all keen to find a solution. Uh, and when we find these win-win solutions, things that look fine on both respects, you know, it's, we plant trees, it's, it's better for the landscape, it's good for the climate, it helps biodiversity. We just tend to be enthusiastic and it's, 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 it's great you know, that we still get enthusiastic about solutions, but at some point we need some reality checks and, uh, and we need to make sure that people don't lose sight of what's the real challenge, and which is to reduce emissions. Yeah, that's very well said. I've also been very impressed at your work about what might work as incentives for protecting landscapes and which incentives work in the business space and which work in other spaces. Where do you think there are opportunities for incentives that we haven't fully developed? Well, I just put some context to that question. So I. Now, I've been kind of full circle on the land use policies. I've started, as, as is natural, to, to look at the kind of public policies to protect land. And uh, these are the kind of command and control approach via land use zoning, protected areas. But then with that leakage issue that we discussed just before, a lot of the countries that were getting it right were just pushing land use elsewhere. And, and that's because we live in a global, globalization era where we move goods, you know, timber and textile and uh, fibers, you know, uh, uh, very easily. So that's why it's also important to think about how to rely on global supply chains and how to uh, promote some sustainability commitment that are being implemented via supply chains or via the economy. But of course, now we are in the realm of voluntary action. It's not a command and control mechanism. It's some economic actors that in a voluntary way agree to pledge that they will remove deforestation from their supply chain or they will uh, eco-certify all their palm oil or their cotton, etc. And so that's why you need incentives because it's voluntary. Uh, and, and here, you know, depending on which actors you're dealing with, you find some very different sets of incentives. Companies seem to be very much motivated by reputation management, how to minimize the risk of a naming and shaming campaign by NGOs, how to minimize the risk that there will be front page in the New York Times one morning, you know, denouncing their practice. And, 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 and so they kind of anticipate this risk by, uh, by making these pledges. So that's a very strong incentive. Another incentive for the private sector is to preempt public regulations. When they know that one issue is becoming very salient, that is a risk for major regulation, they would rather be self-regulated than wait that some government will you know, ban deforestation in, in a territory. Now, when you talk about consumers, of course, you know, the incentives become very different. Uh, um, it's all about uh, trying to create some so some, you know, give, give more meaning in the consumption where through your consumption is not just satisfying your individualistic values about you know, getting that good at the lowest possible price, but, but try to convey some univer universalistic value through your consumption, that through your consumption you are trying to promote a common good by agreeing to pay a small price premium to get your coffee eco-certified, knowing therefore that it does promote some uh, social and ecological values at the place of production. And do you feel like we have, in general, made progress through these kind of incentive programs? Or, and is it worth continuing to focus on them? Yeah, I, again, I think it's the same diagnostic. We, we have designed a lot of these programs. We've piloted them. We've evaluated them. And they were great once they are implemented locally. Just, but typically, the market share of, of eco-certification typically is between 5 to 20 percent. And, and beyond that, you, you reach a plateau. Uh, um, payment for ecosystem services, there's something like, I think, 400 schemes in the world of payments of ecosystem services. But they represent a tiny, tiny fraction of, of all commercial transactions in the world. 
maybe there are something like 400 very progressive companies that have made zero deforestation pledges, but typically you stop there. So now the question is, now that we know the solution, we know they work, how do we move from 5% market share to 80%? You know, let's not even dream about 100%. And that's where, you know, I'm, I, as I said, I went full circle. I started by working on public policies, then I moved to this private governance. But in order to upscale these initiatives, these private initiatives, I see only, way, only one way is when governments endorse, support, or mandate some of these standards in order to reach a scale that's significant enough to really have an impact on, on, the, on, the, uh, on land. Yes. But in some ways, that also is a public pressure motivator, it just goes through the government when enough people are emphatic about the need to imply these new standards. Right, but, but somehow it has, be, it has to be more than pressure. Uh, uh, in the few success stories, you see that a, a, a government policy fully absorbs a, a voluntary standard that has been implemented very successfully by a very small fraction of progressive actors in the economy. Just one or two examples. Uh, uh, very recently, Mozambique, you know, not a, a pioneer country in terms of sustainability, but they just decide that uh, they will mandate the standard of the Better Cotton Initiative into law for all the producers of cotton in their country. BCI, Better Cotton Initiative, is a very pioneer standard for sustainable textile that has a pretty low market share, but, but still was proven to really have an impact. Now, once the government of Mozambique decided, okay, this is becoming low now, then suddenly 100% of the producers adopt that standard. They have no choice, and that's a, ma a major upscaling mechanism. And we find a few examples of that, not many, but a few examples. But let me ask uh, on behalf of the people assembled here, and, and me too, as, as a consumer, which are the sustainability criteria that I should look for in my own shopping and, and advising? Okay, so first I would say that any eco label would be better than no label at all. <laughs> so that should never be an excuse you know, not to go for it. But, uh, and, and that's why it becomes tricky because, of course, in most cases, you have some NGO that pioneers some really stringent eco labels. And often the response of industry is to dilute these labels by through a proliferation of much, much weaker standards. And of course, the average consumer doesn't have the time yeah. to check you know, the value of each of these labels and decide which one I'm going to take or not. For coffee, clearly, Rainforest Alliance would be one of the most stringent ones, and 4C would be a pretty weak, a pretty weak one. But then some people will argue, well, maybe it's better to have a weak standard with a very large market share, and once producers are in the system, then step by step, you upgrade your standard. So that's always that debate between market share and stringency, where you have a very stringent standard, but only 2% of producers subscribe. So these are two different philosophies. If you can go for the stringent one, I think that's certainly uh, uh, helping the market. One of the... Shocking fact on this is if we stick with coffee for a minute, uh, um, if we look at uh, all the certified coffee, only a quarter of the coffee that's being produced according to a certification standard is actually sold as certified coffee. So the supply of eco-certified product is much, much greater than the demand. And we all know when supply is larger than demand, so the price decrease. In this case, the price premium decreases. So the additional price that a coffee producer would be paid for being certified today is something like 2% above market price. A ridiculous amount, knowing that they have to, to, to meet more than 90 criteria. They have, they have to be audited every year. They have to pay themselves the auditor. So, so clearly, that's why I'm saying any equal label you know, would be and, better than and, none. There is the, so the problem is the lack of consumer demand for the certified product. Right. And do you think that's mainly an education issue or? I guess so. I guess information education, even though these eco labels have been around for more than 20 years. So, so, so what, what is needed? I think what we see with companies and countries, the fact that you have a few progressive groups that move ahead, 
and then you have some laggers way behind, and then you have this kind of mass that's kind of it's very passive. You find the same with consumers. You know, you have a few progressive consumers that will take the time to get the information, and then behind you have this mass of you know, conditional cooperator. They will do it if 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 that's the rule, and you will, you will have a few layers always. But that's why you know integrating these into government policies, or or internalizing that into the policy of very very large companies that concentrate most of the trade. When an IKEA says that 100% of its wood will be FSC certified mm -hmm. or, or, or all its textile will be BCI certified, then it's not up to the consumer to decide whether they want this eco-certified or not. So if they go to IKEA, it will all be certified. Again, it's another upscaling mechanism. And, and what have you seen as the factors that have led the big companies like IKEA or Home Depot to adopt these in a comprehensive way? What, what, what do they see as the motivation? Well, what they will tell you, of course, is that they want to do something good for the world and, uh, and, and, and for, for all stakeholders. And um, of course, you know, they are businesses, so one of the motivations is to gain market share. They are not blind to what's happening among consumers. They do detect that there's you know, these sustainability values increasingly influence consumer choice, and so they want to be ahead of the pack. They want to be the leaders. They want to be viewed as progressive. That's part of the, the, the image. I mentioned before already the reputation management. They want to avoid being accused for you know, causing some child labor or some deforestation somewhere in the world. Something very interesting that I found by interviewing many of these executives, so they give you that nice discourse but then after, off track, they will tell you, in reality, a key motivation is the ability to recruit the best brains among our employees. You know, your generation here are not going to work for an arm dealer or a cigarette factory or an oil company that has a very bad reputation. Zombie apocalypse. <laughs> yes. They yeah. know that. And actually, in Europe now, you know, there's a movement of engineers, young engineers in the engineering school where they sign a chart where they say they commit not ever work to work for these companies with a bad reputation in terms of social uh, impact and environmental impact. And you know, these companies, they know that, and they see that, and they need to hire the best and the brightest. You could even quantify that, actually. Some, I've seen a study where someone compared the salary of young executives in, in normal companies and companies with a very bad reputation. And on average, if you work for a, a company with a bad reputation with the same skills, same expertise, you have to, pay, to be paid about 20 to 30% more than if you work for a company with a good reputation. That's so that's, that's, a that's, quite the, a powerful incentive. that's the salary yeah. of shame, in a sense. Yeah. You know, and that, that's a big incentive for these companies. Yeah. Yes. Well, I can, I can promise that when I get home tonight, I am going to review my own personal uh, commitment to the sustainability standards. And I think it's easy to, it's easy to overlook them. I, I wanted to ask just a couple of things about uh, your personal <laughs> incentives. You're, you're one of the only faculty members I know who uh, spends half the year at one university and half in another. And I, I wonder if you could just say a few words about your now long-term experience spending half your time in Belgium and half your time at Stanford. Well, this is great. I spend the winter here. <laughs> if you've been in Belgium in winter, you know, you know it's a Gray sky, very low, and uh, no, not, that's not the only motivation, of course. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> no, I really try to get the best of the two worlds, and, and, and they are very, very different worlds, you know, between old Europe, old Belgium, and the Silicon Valley here. In terms of governance, what really strikes me is that uh, while in Europe, the approach is very much kind of regulation, common and control, the commission, just sign a beautiful new green deal, but the commission will dictate the terms of how to become more sustainable. And in this part of the world, at least on the West Coast, there's still this notion that technology will solve that. You know, by innovation, by invention, we'll, we'll get out of it. And, and probably the truth is some, some, somewhere in between, uh, but it's very interesting to be, you know, to go from one part of the world to the other. Also, the fact that it's, it's every six months, whenever I come back here or I go back to Europe, I have about a, a month where I'm kind of seeing everything with a new perspective. I just see things that I had not seen the year before. 
it, it's very interesting to see how quickly your brain adjusts to a new situation and, and things that may be shocking initially just become the norm and you just, okay, that's how it is. But because I keep moving back and forth, you know, every time I read this, oh, wow. You know, this, <laughs> and I've been doing that for 12 years, 11 You're years now. There, so, yeah. and, 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 and I keep discovering new dimension and on both sides, not just in the US, but also in Europe. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to questions from the audience, just a, one, a couple more. Uh, but you can start thinking of your questions. And, and you mentioned horses a couple times. Eric is one of, well, he's the only faculty member I know who's a, who's a top international dressage rider. And I know that horses have been a really important part of your life. Say a little more about that. Well, I just love horses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just beautiful animals. <laughs> they are very, I love the sport horses, you know, thoroughbreds with a lot of blood. They are very difficult, very sensitive, very emotional animals. And uh, it, I could rationalize that, you know. I, I could say this is the ultimate coupled human natural system. You know? <laughs> you know, when you ride a horse, you really have to interact. And that's really at the heart of my work. You know, I'm, I'm studying coupled human natural system. But, but, but fundamentally, you know, since I was a small kid, I've always enjoyed horse. And, and to be frank, that's why I'm really happy, you know, when I'm surrounded by horse and I just feel relaxed and I, but it's also, also a very important part of, of being creative, creative and, and being able to keep some distance from your work, and if you get too much embedded in your work, as we all know, you lose perspective, you just get too bogged down in some issues. Then I just go on my hold, I spend a couple of hours, I come back and I'm refreshed and I, I'm serene and I can just- The uh, ecology of happiness. Exactly, in action. <laughs> um, let me just ask one, one last thing. What, what are the scientific problems that you're most excited about now? What's, what's gonna be next in your lab? Well, as you could have guessed in our conversation, that question of upscaling, and I'm working on this with Jim Leap here and a couple of other people, but uh, I've been working now for the last five years on all this private governance mechanism. And, and you know, I was really a bead when we evaluated the effectiveness of one payment for ecosystem service scheme in, among a few hundred farmers in Uganda and eco-certification in Colombia and, and all these little things. And, and they all were great, but gee, you know, this is not enough. We, we need to move at scale. And, and, and so that's really my, what keeps me awake at night now in how can we move from all these successful pilot experiment to something at scale. And, and that's where thinking in terms of policy mixes where you, and, and coalitions between governments, civil societies, NGOs, companies, communities, producers, you know, how can we create mechanisms where they align the objectives and they may differ on many fronts, they may function according to different themes, but how to create some alignment whereby they can actually together improve the sustainability of their, at least their, their, their place, their jurisdiction. Or, Very cool. Yeah. Um, I, why don't we go now to questions from the audience? Eric, do you want to just pick? Okay. Okay, let, let's start. Yeah. I graduated from Stanford. Oh, yeah, please wait for the microphone. I graduated from Stanford 50 years ago, and I've had the good fortune of teaching here for two winter quarters. With your experience of being in Belgium and being at Stanford, my observation is that the students at Stanford and indeed the faculty are very, very serious, and they don't laugh very much. <laughs> and if you're talking about the ecology, uh, question, laughter is very natural and very healthy process. How would you compare your Belgium students to Stanford students? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> if I may, without offending anyone here, what you said about my students, I would also say that about my colleagues, you know. <laughs> They're great colleagues, really super scientists. But yes, you know, there's a level of dedication, of seriousness, of focus here that makes what Stanford is, you know, a super great place. And, and, and that's why I'm here, you know, I really, I'm very stimulated by working, by working uh, um, uh, in this environment. But yes, sometimes we could find a better trade-off be, between, be, be, between being really good scholars and be, being, you know, happy people, good, good persons, you know, with some well-being. I think that, Take that probably would make our science better, more productive, I think, also, yes. Jeff, you know, I, was, I will move that way, okay? Jeff, yes. Jeff, no? Yes, awesome. Thanks, Eric. 
So I, nobody ever accused me of being too serious, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay, you are the old liar. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to come back to the issue that you and Chris were exploring about this government, sort of this tension between government and, and, and environmentalism and, and sort of consumer activism and government regulation. So, it, you know, you wrote your book in 2008, which was probably a time when most of us felt quite optimistic about the prospects of, of actually doing something about climate. And here we are 12 years later, you know, in probably feeling very pessimistic. In 2008, the environmental movement was feeling optimistic. Probably a lot of industries in the United States were feeling very hard done by. And now it's, it's the reverse, right? So it seems to me, this is, you know, when you talk about government regulation, that's, that's not the answer. We need to create an environmental ethos that transcends the politics of elections and parties. And we haven't got there yet. And I'm just wondering, you know, what hope is there? Because we should, it, it should be independent of, of whether it's Republicans in this country or Democrats. You know, the government policy should transcend that. How do we get to the point where everybody buys into that? So that it's whether you are, you know, an environmentalist or whether you're a consumer or whether you're an industry that's regulated that you feel, you know, that it's a fair level playing field in all respects. Right. I mean, it's a, it's, to me, it's the, you know, we have to get to the pre-92 days again, somehow. Okay, of course, if you live in the US, if you're American, I fully understand why you're pessimistic today. Same if you live in Brazil, you know, it's a huge backtrack. But if you live in France, with Macron being a pretty enlightened leader and, and other place. And, and if you're now in the, if you've followed what happens in the European Union now with the commission just launching its new Green Deal two weeks after the new uh, administration took power, I think that's pretty hopeful and that Green Deal is really strong and, and comprehensive. But uh, to come back at the heart of your question, I did mention before you know, the shift from kind of government approach to policies to a more multi-stakeholder approach, this coalition with the, the, the rise of, of the private sector, of civil society, of, of consumer movements, of, of local communities uh, to, to the plate. And, and something we see very strongly in Brazil in, in 2006, the four largest traders in soy sign what we call the soy moratorium, where they committed not to buy any soy that would come from a farm that uh, had some deforestation. And of course, they only signed it because there was some really nasty and heavy campaign by, by NGOs. No, they didn't do that just because they, th they felt it was a good thing. So now we have Bolsonaro, who's not going to enforce any anti-deforestation policies. But, but, but these companies, are not going to uh, change their pledge. No, they've signed that publicly. No, they're under scrutiny by, 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 by these NGOs. So this is bringing a lot of stability. And actually, even though we've seen the fires in the Amazon increasing, so far, the rates of deforestation have increased, but not dramatically. You know, it's not like we've opened the gate. Because you have that other actor, you know, set of actors, the private sector that's there, and the civil society, which is watching. Now, maybe next round we'll have a great president, but then in some of these companies, they will say, well, you know, what the hell about this whole moratorium? Well, but we will have a new president maybe that will implement that. So having multiple stakeholders, that's the whole concept of polycentric governance, rather than having just one big center of governance with all these multiple centers at different scales, and eventually, you know, at least a fraction of them will just keep going. Um, so that's a source of hope. I would Eric, say. do you want to say something about the way you see the environment space, environmental consciousness, and, and progress evolving over the 30 years that you've been a close observer? Well, to come back to a question I got about you know, going back and forth between in Europe, Europe and here, that's why I see also a big, big divergence. You know, in Europe now, with all the kids in the street every Friday, um, I have two daughters, you know, if they invite their friends at home, no one would even see some meat at some distance. You know, they're all vegetarian, they will all come by bike, you know, it's just, 
there's been a massive shift uh, in, in Europe in, uh, in that young generation over the last five years, I would say. And, and of course, this is taking place in the US, but quite at a different pace. And, and I cannot explain why. I, I don't know why. You know, people are bright here. They're as well informed as they could be anywhere else. I just don't see why culturally these values don't have as much traction in the US than they do in Europe, at least in Northern Europe, yes. Would you mind saying who you are too? Um, my name is Rich. Uh, the first thing I'll say is my favorite beer is from Belgium and I can't find it in this country, so the next time you come back, bring a couple okay. cakes for me, please. Um, Addressing the last point you made, in a, in a way, I guess, um, you've talked a lot about other countries. I've heard Brazil and Colombia and in Vietnam, but you, you didn't really talk about this country, and we really don't talk about this country, yet in California we clear-cut more forests than any other state in the Union for timber, in Seattle, Washington as well, and due to some things that the European Union, offshoring energy, we're now biomassing at incredible rates in the southeast, and we're clear-cutting virgin forests at, at enormous rates, yet we don't talk about it. It's never in the news. How bad is it, and why can't things like this make it into our news when, when these are very serious issues? And, and I know the clear-cutting in California has been going on for about 20 years. Biomassing is you know, five, six, seven years old, but it's, it's increasing due to the European Union. I guess we can blame Belgium for that as well. Absolutely, yes. They yes. good beer and bad green policies. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually, I wrote with some colleagues about that. The uh, EU had a biofuel directive that was mostly relying on, on crops. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, we realized that was really creating a lot of competition for food crops. And it was displacing, in, through an indirect mechanism, crop toward the Amazon, Indonesia. And so a couple of years ago, the commission said, okay, we'll rectify that, so we'll just change this directive, and now we'll promote woody biomass as a source of biofuels. And boom again, you know, they make the same mistake. They just didn't think about that. And then uh, we did all the calculation, and we published that in Nature of, uh, last year, and uh, we showed in indeed that uh, if the target of woody biomass has to be met, that represents massive, massive deforestation, much more wood extraction than the sustain, sustainable yield of current tree plantations. And, and, and it's true, a lot of that is coming from Florida uh, in the form of pellets. It's, it's shocking to see that uh, you, know, you make the mistake once, it's being denounced by the scientific community massively, they say, okay, we'll rectify, but then the rectification created another problem, very similar to the first one that was not foreseen. Um, I have a hard time understanding that, and, and I do very, very, very little, almost no lobbying, but uh, that's a case where I did. You know, I did spend about a week with some colleagues working in the corridors of the European Parliament, one week before that uh, directive was going to be voted, and, and we're talking to parliamentarians, I say, okay, you're right, you convinced us, and yet I will vote for it because I'm from Sweden, and, you know, and uh, it's very and important for us for the forestry yeah. industry. And, and that's how, you know, just dawned on me that getting the science right is not enough. You know? They get it, they understand it, and yet they will go ahead because they, other, they have other motivations. And, and do you think the main problem there is that forest biofuels are considered carbon-free? Or is the main problem that there's just too big a number associated with the amount of wood that's demanded in the energy system? Yes, it's, it's carbon free if it's only branches and debris and left over. But then when the demand is so high that you have to harvest the wood, especially if you go in boreal forests where the rate of regrowth is extremely slow, you know, it takes 80 years for a tree to regrowth, then it becomes yeah, negative. And, so it's really the combination. It's carbon free, but, but that they call it carbon free right. even when it's not. Exactly, yes. I have a question. Yeah, name, about, name and question. Oh, Jim uh, Salzman. I'm a researcher in uh, language technologies. I have a question about Europe and 
the United States with regard to uh, mitigation solutions. In Europe, uh, they just announced they're building five gigawatts of uh, power to gas. Uh, there's 36 sites, uh, about half of them are demonstration, half of them are production. In the United States, we have two power to gas sites, both demonstration amounting to less than 50 kilowatts. Uh, that's carbon neutral. Carbon negative, displacing wood timber with um, synthetic uh, carbon uh, fiber uh, composite building materials is very popular in Europe. Uh, uh, CO2-chemistry.eu is the CO2 feedstocks for plastics conference on its eighth or ninth year now. <coughs> the only carbon sequestration that anybody talks about in the United States is superfluid injection back into the ground, which increases the cost of natural gas by five and a half times. Nobody's going to pay 24 cents per kilowatt hour for any energy solution. What can we do to bring practical European mitigation solutions to the United States? Aside from moving to Europe. <laughs> I don't know. I Vote. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, help me. Campaign. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Vote, yes. You are more is, in I that mean, field. It is, yes. it, it is interesting to see how um, some technology pathways really catch on and we're willing to, and we're seeing investments. And, you know, I, I think that you're slightly harsh about the willingness of, of, the, um, of the U.S. to look at technologies, but I think it is true that in general uh, we've had a number of really promising technologies that, that have just been kind of too scary, and um, I, 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 mean, I think the same is actually true of Europe when yeah, you look at the uh -huh. technology space there, and this, this wood pellets is uh, definitely not a happy story from the European perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, Jim? Um, so, Eric, you said uh, the path probably lies somewhere in between the sort of European government response and the technology response you see here in Silicon Valley. Could you say a little bit about how new technologies are affecting the dynamics of some of these efforts? Technologies for transparency, for example, traceability and similar? Hmm. Yes. So, on, on one hand, because the regulation are more stringent in Europe that does stimulate more innovation in a sense, but of a certain type of technologies, you know, just technologies to be more energy efficient because you have this, this cap that you know, gets very expensive if you don't meet your target. Um, but, but it's true that a lot of the information space, you know, it's, it's all happening here, you know, it's barely being adopted in Europe. So, so, so it would be interesting to study how the regulatory environment influences the kind of innovation that are taking place on the technology front. You know, whether, depending on what is the major constraint, the dominant constraint to industrial activity, whether you would invest rather than into more efficient technologies or, or, or more on the IT or, or, or other tools. But uh, I'm sure you have an idea. In, in, As you get more and more visibility about what's happening on the ground, right, and more and more ability to connect that to markets, yes. Uh, how does that affect the sort of power of voluntary approaches, and how does it affect the incentives you see companies and governments facing as they look at these issues? Is, yes. Okay. Yes. I see. Okay. I see what you mean. Yes. And do you see that rippling through the systems you're looking at? Has that changed how things play out over the last, say, yes? Decade? Yeah. Okay. And and of course you refer to very high resolution satellites these days. Trade data, you know, there's this incredible database called Trace, where anyone can go and you can trace, trace, yes, the, well, the, you know, the import of palm oil in Belgium to the municipality where it's coming from in Indonesia or in Brazil, and 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 you know the biodiversity number in that municipality and the rate of deforestation. So, so yes, no, so now the private sector cannot hide behind this black box of, well, it's coming, you know, it's sustainable, it's coming from there, we don't know exactly. And, and this has led to a, a clear movement also to shorten the supply chains. You know, there's a big movement for coffee and cocoa about direct trade, 
um, so, so yes, that's a, that's a major, major driving force. Yes, that uh, in order to enforce a commitment, you need to need to not need to know first where it's coming from. That's one of the reasons why all these zero deforestation pledges that companies have made didn't really pan out as quickly as they were hoping because suddenly they realized they had no visibility on the supply chain. They only knew the first tier uh, uh, supplier, but they didn't know at all where the palm oil was coming from actually on the ground. And, uh, and so they've been invested though quite a bit for the last 10 years in increasing their traceability. And that technology, including high resolution satellite and trade data and iPhone, et cetera, has really contributed in a major way. So hopefully we'll get into a world where we'll see that. Now, this is easy for food products because usually you know, they, it's produced in Indonesia, it goes to Belgium. It gets very complicated with electronics, minerals, because then there are many, many, many stages of transformation and they would go through five or 20 countries before they end up in your computer and your iPhone. So in that case, traceability gets very diluted. Tony. Uh That's awesome uh, discourse. Um, looking towards the future and talking about technology, can you speculate on public opinion if uh, the uh, trillion trees, as we search for species, to plant genetically modified trees that are more fire resistant uh, or more photosynthetic uh, efficient sequester more CO2 and release more ox oxygen. Uh, this can be a, a, a disruption to the local fauna. Uh, do you think a <clears throat> proper management of where to plant these uh, uh, super trees that come? Right, yes. So it's interesting because that your question also suggests that you know we can have this positive tipping points. You know, we, we can come with major new innovation that can suddenly uh, um, you know, change completely the way we view one solution. Um, genetically modified trees, another big difference between Europe and the US. I'm sure in the US it would be accepted quite uh, openly and with no major problem. For a reason that I can still understand, in Europe there's a resistance to GMOs. I've tried to understand that many times talking with my peers and I just don't get it. I, I think in the, deeply I think it's religious, you know, it's just this notion you don't mess up with nature, that's the privilege of God. And, and yet I'm not even sure that Europe is much more religious than the US is, but uh, that's my only understanding of if I would have to attribute that. But yes, some GMOs can do great things, though they can enrich rise in iron and other things, and they could potentially increase rate of sequestration, and I don't see why we should not use these technologies with the appropriate safeguards, as with any technology, of course, yes. But much of what you've been talking about is taking a precautionary approach and not doing every, the one thing everywhere, but yes, looking right. for diverse yeah, exactly. solutions. Yes, exactly. You test something, sense. you pilot, you observe, you evaluate, and then slowly you upscale, yes. yes. Hi, my name's Felicity. Um, I'm just curious, one of the things that's, that's happening along with uh, the, all the things contributing to climate change is a massive demographic change in the world. And more and more of the countries that have been dealing with this, either innovatively, as in, in Europe or in some of the other countries you mentioned, or in the United States, are getting older. And the youth of the world in another uh, 50 years is going to be concentrated in Africa and the Middle East. How is that going to change what's going to happen with um, all these uh, efforts to control uh, and mitigate for the climate change? Yes. Three-fourths of the forthcoming increase in population will take place in Sub-Saharan Africa, so that will be a, a major shift. Um, of course, it will all depend on how this demographic change is being paralleled or not by cultural change, change in value, change in governance, change in technology. But yes, we see, we foresee 
a major shift in the center of gravity of the world economy, now toward Asia, but in another 30 years toward Africa. Uh, um, we've seen that massive migration is not the solution. You know, it does create major social tensions. So, so I think economic activity and, and center of governance will have to migrate to where the young labor force is, which will definitely be in Central Africa. Now, the rate at which this transition will take place, I think is really frightening because we talk about 40, 50 years. We don't talk about uh, 300 years. So that does require, no, no, sorry, not 50, uh, until 2000, 2100, but you know, that, that will be very fast compared to the kind of transition we've experienced now. So when we see, I've, I've worked a lot in Africa, I'm still going there quite often. When we see the level of infrastructure there, you just, you know, you're almost at square zero, you know, everything has to be built, which in one hand is an opportunity. You can leapfrog some of these dirty technologies, you can redesign cities. But on the other hand, I think the rate of change is just such a challenge. I, I, I'm a bit scared about what's going to happen on that front, yes. So the rate of change is it's not gonna be good for uh, environmental sustainability? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. It will have to be somehow, you know, we have to reconcile somehow this demographic change with some sustainable livelihood. Yes. I saw there were a couple of other hands that had come up on this side. Okay, let's go back that. on this side, yes. <laughs> you began by talking about the importance of windows because of our natural affinity for nature and trees. And I wonder if you think we have a natural affinity for force as well, um, and a natural tendency to think like a geographer, or is that something that you have to really sort of train students to think like? Okay. I do, but I don't know whether it's universal. The theory from Biophilia is that the uh, first our ancestors develop in savanna environments. Now, the savanna environments are the most favorable for hunter-gatherer because you have some view, you can see some predators coming, you have some clumps of trees where you can hide, you have some water streams, some gentle hills. And, and my theory, that's why so many people love golf. You know, I'm looking at Jeff here. <laughs> if you look at golf courses, <laughs> if you look at golf course, they really reproduce this kind of savanna, this rolling hill, this green grass where you can have some gazelles that you can hunt. But then you have these little clumps of trees where you can hide and these little fountains. That, that's also why the Park of Versailles in Paris you know, has these fountains and these little hedges all around. So, so the theory would be that the innate affinity is mostly with this open landscape with some clumps of trees because that's the one that sends you the signal that the condition for your survival are guaranteed. While in a forest environment, it's kind of dangerous environment. You could have a lion hiding there, you would not see it. And, uh, and there's been some really ex interesting experiments um, a series of photographs with different types of landscapes, forests, deserts, savannas have been presented to people from all types of culture, from Alaska to Papua New Guinea to New York, downtown New York. And, and, and largely, the majority of people point the savanna landscape as being the one they prefer, the most peaceful, the most serene. So that somehow validates that notion of biophilia. No, that's where we really come from. But I think the... Uh, the uh, park, I forgot the name, the uh, bio, bio, biological reserve. Jasper Ridge. Jasper Ridge. <laughs> that's, that's exactly the kind of landscape we talk about, right? High grass, some beautiful trees, but some nice views as well. So. Thank you, Eric, for your talk. It's such a pleasure to get to hear about the a wide range of your work. And I wanted to um, engage with you as a geographer um, who studied in so many different places and is thinking about the layers of impacts, you know, from you know, human environment interactions in multiple places. And um, as you study certification and other kinds of, you know, governance interventions and um, environmental regulation and markets, I wanted to ask, um, you know, what are your views on um, those governance interventions 
um, ability to redistribute resources and build greater equity um, alongside some of the sustainability goals for environmental protection. Right, great question. That's really, really important dimension that's really tightly coupled with the sustainability question. Um, I think that's raised the whole question of multi-scale governance. We've been thinking too much in the traditional political science about decentral governance, big, the national scale governments. There's a lot of interest, as you know, about this second tier or third tier jurisdiction being very legitimate set of governance where that's why you can implement these local small solutions. That's why you can fine tune the solution to the local context. That's why you can create the dense social network through which you can circulate these new innovation. That's also the best level where you can create this dialogue, this coalition between government, civil society, and, and, uh, and the private sector. So I think a lot of the attention now is moving to this second, third tier level of governance where you know, that would be the kind of center of sustainability innovation from which you would upscale to the uh, higher level. But again, there's enormous variation from one country to the other. Some countries have this long tradition of central planning, centralization, France, China, et cetera, and others. And because they're very heterogeneous, environment or ethnic groups have this long tradition of, of relying more on this kind of lower level uh, uh, governance system. And, and how vigilant do we need to be about sustainability initiatives getting hijacked by the vested interests and the wealthy actors? They will always be. They will always be attempted to hijack that. And, and every actor is going to try to divert the process for their own interest. But, but if one, we, we produce the right level of scientific information and, and make it available to all the stakeholders so at least they can negotiate with the, all the data in their hand, and, and if we create this forum where they can all negotiate around a round table, you know, where everyone has the same power position, then I think we can mitigate some of that risk. But I think that risk will always be there. And it's all about, a, yes, creating a process that's fair and equitable where everyone has a voice. But we know that indigenous species, poor, marginalized people will always have a much weaker power in these negotiations. And that's where either civil society or some kind of higher level procedure can ensure that it is a fair process of negotiation that leads to an outcome that's equitable for all actors. It's, it's a huge challenge, yes. Why don't we take a couple more questions? Ah, okay. This way, and then we'll I move. I saw three hands. When, uh, okay. Right <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, I'm Diane. I, uh, I'm a recent postdoc with uh, Nicole Arduin, Social Ecology Lab. Um, I, um, I'd like to ask a question. You kind of mentioned briefly um, that here in Silicon Valley, we, um, we, or I mean, the community tends to think that we can solve everything with technology, but... Um, with apps. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was actually wondering what is your opinion um, about what is the actual power of Silicon Valley in uh, creating change uh, for sustainability? Um, I've been looking a little, trying to follow trends a little bit locally, and um, as far as I noticed, there is definitely the big strategy that Microsoft announced. So I see that as potentially the power of big corporations to uh, be pioneers and influence other companies to follow the lead. Um, I also uh, see that philanthropy is much more interested in investing in, um, they, they've been trying to talk about how to create movements. And I, I feel that's pretty much following what's been happening in Europe. Um, so there's also the investment power that we have here and big philanthropic foundations can define what they're going to invest in and kind of like influence the agenda. And finally, Maybe there's you can this... Just come in on, on those points. Right, yes. Yeah. So, yes. So, you know, in this Silicon Valley, you have these two aspects. You have these new technologies that, of course, are changing the world in a massive way. And what about sustainability? 
I will never forget, uh, a few months ago, I was giving a public lecture in, uh, in, in Europe, and, and the audience was very diverse in age. And then there were some people that were the organizers of this March for the Climate, and they started to blame all my generation for flying too much. They said, why well, we, you should not fly? And then one, one person, more senior person, just stood up and said, well, you should stop using Instagram, Facebook, and uh, WhatsApp, because these consume a huge amount of energy. Actually, if you look at the number, you know, all these digital media, that's about 3% of global electricity consumption, and flying is about 2%, not electricity, but of uh, energy. So they are both the same in terms of uh, energy consumption. So just the idea that all the social media is going to save the world for sustainability while you have this huge electricity footprint, I think it's uh, questionable. But then there's the other aspect, which is the philanthropy, which is absolutely remarkable. We all read about Jeff Bezos committing $10 billion you know, for climate, and, uh, I think this is great. Um, at one point, you need some level of coordination between all these initiatives. You know, otherwise, it's not efficient if you just everyone goes through their pet projects or the most iconic projects in the Amazon or somewhere. I think you know, there's a risk of leaving major, major gaps there or not focusing on this, some, some of the key issues. So yes, philanthropy plays a huge role, but some level of orchestration you know, organization at a macro level, I think, is very important. And that cannot come from the Silicon Valley. That has to come from elsewhere. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm from the Hadley Lab. Um, I wanted to follow up on the question regarding uh, the demographic boom in Africa and the increasing tensions that are happening on this continent. I mean, there's an increasing uh, wild, uh, illegal wildlife trade. There's overfishing. There's mining going on. I mean, the tensions are growing and growing. And one country in particular, China, has been buying a lot of Africa so far. And I was wondering, what do you think in this context and in the following decades, what should be the role of European countries in Africa, given their colonial past? Should they have a role at all? Yes, good question. <clears throat> I, I did my master thesis in Rwanda, which is a former Belgian colony. And after one month, I conclude never again I will work in a former colony of my country. <laughs> And then I did my PhD thesis in Burkina Faso, which is a former French colony. And I could see all the advantages I had being a Belgian researcher compared to my colleagues from France. So it's a very, very hard, you know, relationships to manage when you're part of a former colonial power. You know, this, this, just, this just leaves some scars for generations to come. And, and, and as a result, I think Europe's tried to stay kind of off you know, hands off a little bit of some of their former colonies and, and, and very quickly, you know, they can be accused of, of behaving like neo-colonialists. So it's a very, very difficult relationship, I think. And it will take another couple of generations for this to, to be erased. So it's... Um, and, and I understand at least in one of those two countries, you barely escaped being arrested as a spy. I don't know if that's yes, a story actually, you want to share. Yes. Well, I escaped, but I was arrested, yes. <laughs> no, you were arrested. Yes. <laughs> a couple of days in jail, actually. <laughs> yes. so, uh, I want to ask a question about land use, which I think is very, very difficult. So E.O. Wilson wrote a book a few years ago called Half Earth. And we want to save half of the Earth's surface for wildness, basically. Um, what are your thoughts on that? After you have, you've now said, you know, natural solutions is some tiny portion of what we can do. Do we, is he smoking something? Is, you know, what's the, yeah. Okay. I think these kind of targets are great to communicate an ambition to mobilize people, half Earth, zero deforestation, 1.5 degree, you know, this is really helpful just to mobilize, to communicate. But, but when you look at the nitty gritty of the science, you know, it just doesn't work. You know, there's no way we can give back half of the earth to nature. Oh, yes, if it's all Siberia and, and Sahara and uh, these places. But the idea is to have half of every eco biome, uh, eco zone in the world. And there's been some very serious calculation on that uh, uh, in, in my scientific community. And, and it just doesn't fly. Uh, um, but it doesn't mean that we should abandon this kind of slogan. I think they are just a way to focus 
uh, policy efforts. And, but we know in advance we are not going to return half Earth. But if it's a third of it, why not? You know, this is still very good. And, and I think we're all facing that. You know, on one hand, we need to communicate to the public these very, very complex policy issues. And then we need to get it right in terms of science. And, and sometimes there's some disconnect between these two discourse. OK, I'm going to just say three things, and then you can join me in, in thanking Erica. The first is that it's really been a fabulous conversation in your last comment about finding a middle way between the political priorities and the scientific priorities is, is incredibly helpful. And I think that we could all use that as a, um, as, as a guide to the way we live our lives. The, the second thing I want to say is that I don't know how many of you will have another chance to congratulate Eric on the Blue Planet Prize. So when you applaud after I'm done, uh, make it really good, because this is your one chance to, to uh, really commemorate something that's a, a, a wonderful accomplishment for Eric and, and, and a wonderful uh, accomplishment for Stanford as well. And then a third, I just want to close by thanking all of you for a really rich conversation around a wonderful set of topics. And I look forward to seeing all of you at our next environmental conversation. So thank you again, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much.